Your name is familiar from the EDA space, of course. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> still, still trying to hide from those pests. <laughs> is that right? Yeah. No, you can't escape. <laughs> How's it go? You can check out, but you can never leave. <laughs> okay, so uh, I wonder if we can uh, get started. And uh, so it's uh, my privilege to introduce this week's uh, EECS colloquium speaker. And uh, uh, let me put a little context onto it. One of the big trends uh, that has emerged in the past uh, three or four years is uh, machine intelligence, uh, uh, deep learning, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, etc. cetera. And uh, at first, it was just part of computer science. It was a style of programming. But uh, gradually, people came to realize that it called for a complete change in hardware so that you could uh, speed things up uh, very drastically. And uh, so overall, it represents uh, the beginning of a change from the von Neumann architecture to a new uh, uh, learning architecture. Uh, and I, uh, you know, the, the expression is we had a, a CPU, then we had a GPU, and then uh, we had an IPU. Now, uh, the IPU was the intelligent processing unit. And uh, so we'll see if that uh, nomenclature catches on. So uh, Simon Knowles is uh, in the center of this. He is the co-founder and CTO of GraphCore, uh, which is developing uh, processors for machine intelligence. He himself is a uh, veteran uh, processor designer. Uh, actually, uh, GraphCore is his uh, third chip company. He previously uh, co-founded Element 14, which was acquired by Broadcom and Isera, which was acquired by NVIDIA. And NVIDIA is certainly a competitor in this field, as you know. Mm. Uh, so uh, he is an electrical uh, science graduate from the University of Cambridge in the UK. So let's give him uh, a big hand. Thank you, Eli. And uh, thank you, uh, Berkeley at large, for uh, inviting me to come along and uh, tell you a little bit about our uh, venture. GraphCore is um, a young company. Uh, we've actually been working on this machine for about three years, um, but we only announced our presence about one year ago. And uh, we now have about uh, 70 people in the company, um, almost all engineers at this point because we have not yet launched our product. In fact, we've said very little about our product. Um, but I will tell you a bit more about our product today than has been said mm -hmm. before. So. You have, that, uh, you have that privilege. What we're most famous for at this stage is producing these beautiful pictures. Um, these are all pictures of graphs. I'll show you a few as we go through. Um, they're graphs that uh, are used by our own uh, programming tools framework, which operate, operates at a, a level of granularity that's quite fine to match to our parallel processing machine. So these graphs typically have millions of vertices in. This one's uh, Baidu's uh, deep voice uh, wave net picture. It's amazing how organic a lot of these things work. They are of no practical use to anybody developing any machine learning algorithms or, uh, or processors. They're just beautiful to look at. And uh, we blow them up and we put them around our office because it's cheaper than paying artists. <laughs> <coughs> so GraphCore is what the investment community would refer to as a picks and shovels business. We don't develop AI or MI as I prefer to call it, applications. Um, we're developing machines which we hope other people will use to deliver interesting, intelligent applications. Um, obviously, you can't sell machines without tools. And these, these are new, they're a new type of machine, so we can expect them to, be, to, to use a new type of tool. Uh, and we have certainly seen the emergence of new programming tools in the form of uh, machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow already. I think we'll see a lot more creativity there as well. <laughs> I noticed that the IPU, I, I just uh, thought of that, but you're actually using the IPU name. Uh, we are, yes, yes. I'm expecting resistance from David, who, who might prefer that it was called TPU. I don't <laughs> care, to be honest. <laughs> so long as it's not a GPU, it's fine. <laughs> um, so we have uh, certainly programming tools. We have a new machine architecture, which I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, and we will deliver computers and computer subsystems that incorporate chips uh, built around that uh, architecture. Uh, and I like to use the word uh, machine intelligence because I think once we get intelligence right, there'll be nothing artificial about it. Um, it will either be implemented by humans or by machines, but it will be the same thing. So to me, it's not AI, it's not ML, <laughs> it's definitely MI is what we're aiming at. 
Uh, I always find it useful for trying to define what you mean by intelligence. Um, I think everyone who does a presentation on this subject should have a go. Uh, psychologists have been trying for years and have not yet agreed. Um, so there's no end game here. It's, it's for sport. Here's my attempt. I do change this from time to time. So this is an evolved attempt to define what it is we're trying to capture. We're trying to capture the capacity for rational decision making based on imperfect knowledge which adapts with experience. The adaptivity is essential. Uh, without learning, there is no intelligence. If, if, a, uh, if an intelligent or so-called intelligent motor car crashes, um, that might be a perfectly reasonable decision given the data it had. But if we give it exactly the same data a second time and it does exactly the same thing, that would not be intelligent by our normal thinking. So the ability to adapt is essential. The existence of, or the the conduct of problem solving in uncertain environments is essential. Uh, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to imbue machines with the ability to do approximate computing and to learn from experience. Um, we have not done that before with computers that we've designed. We have, we have solved the problems and we have written the solution down, the recipe for solution down as a program and we have asked the computer to follow the recipe. So the computer, so far, 70 years of it, has not helped us to solve problems. And we're trying to move to a world where, in fact, the computer can work out for itself how to solve problems using exactly the same methods as we do. In other words, by trial and error, by learning from experience. And uh, any of the things that we do that machines can't do, probably you could say require intelligence. Personally, I think this is the biggest technology transition. I don't know how long it's going to take. It could take 100 years, it could take 20. But it's the biggest technology transition humans will ever go through. So all you young guys, you, you're very, very privileged to be here at the beginning of this. Um, you know, I've lived through 35 years of Moore's Law. It's been a hoot. <laughs> Machines that I've, the machine I'm going to tell you about today is about a million times more potent in terms of having a compute a uh, number of transistors and runs about a thousand times faster than the first machines I built in one, in one human lifetime, a billion times. Uh, that, is, that is going to be a trivial precursor game to the impact of intelligence on humanity. Um, so no pressure. <laughs> so what do we need to build? Um, to build an intelligent machine we require two parts. I like to put this up because it offends people who think it's much more complicated than this. Of course it is. Of course it is. But this is the simplest picture that I can draw. An intelligent machine ultimately is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence translator. It senses uh, events in its environment as a sequence and it produces a sequence of actions. It may, they're not necessarily related. It doesn't have to produce an action every time it senses something. Um, but ultimately it will produce actions. That's its only observable external characteristic. And it consists of two parts. It consists of a knowledge model that is a condensate of all of the data that it has ever experienced. Uh, a big probability distribution of some sort. And an inference engine that allows it to use that probability distribution to do its sequence to sequence translation. But also to decide how to update the probability distribution. In other words, how to do the condensation of sensed data into useful information. And so in this context, I don't regard training as fundamentally different to inference. There are people who believe that there will be training machines uh, and there will be inference machines. Um, there may well be uh, from the point of view of utility, but I think architecturally it's unnecessary to distinguish them. Uh, learning these models is inference. It's just inference on the model structure or its parameters. But mathematically, the process is the same as using the model to make a decision. So is this a global <coughs> view? In other words, if we have individual you know, uh, intelligent units, how do they learn from each other? Well, this is a view of an agent. This, that's an so an assembly of agents could also be an agent at a more macroscopic scale. And so is there any human society. mechanism by which one knowledge model shared with another, or in other words, or, or is that just not a rabbit you want to chase in this diagram? <laughs> it's not a rabbit I'm chasing in this diagram. This is my simplest possible diagram. <laughs> this is a very big subject. Very big subject. 
Um, and of course, from the point of view of compute inference, whether it is inferencing, I, I would like at this point to make fun of Americans. There is this new word that has emerged, inferencing. It means the same as inferring in English. But the Americans have done the verb to noun to verb thing on it, and that's how we ended up with inferencing. And uh, my old friend Jensen Huang is very fond of that particular um, verb. <coughs> um, but whether you're doing that, whether you're doing inferring, uh, or whether you're, doing, you're using inference to uh, improve your model structure, mathematically, you're always doing some sort of optimization process. Uh, and there are many candidates for the, the best optimization process. There are many candidates for what cost function you're trying to optimize. Um, but you're building a big optimization machine of one sort or another. So um, the first thing that emerges is that these knowledge models are complex. Um, and they can be neatly represented, not only the information in them, but also the algorithms for updating them uh, abstractly as a graph. Um, all you're really saying with that simple statement is that they are probably high dimensional. In other words, they will have many parameters and we expect the parameters, if they are learned well, to be independent of each other. So if they're independent of each other, then they re represent measures on a dimension. So the models are high dimensional. If they're high dimensional and then large, then to be useful, they must be sparse. Otherwise, the model will simply be too large. Um, so sparsity and high dimensionality, how do you represent that data structure in a computer, obviously, as a graph? It turns out to be quite effective, at least at this stage of our learning of how to deal with these machines. If we represent both the knowledge model and the algorithms for learning and using the learned model uh, using the same graph, in other words, a graph where the nodes contain some behavior as well as some information. Uh, this is a graph of AlexNet, again from our tools. Um, and the other interesting characteristic is, and this is a bit of a moot, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put something out there that many people will not agree with. Um, I believe that at least for the long near future that we will deal with static models. In other words, the structure of the graph will not evolve as we do learning or inference on it. Any more than the connection between the neurons in your brain rewire themselves when you think, or the Ethernet cabling in a data center needs to be rewired to run new applications. Now, obviously, you can synthesize the effect of a dynamic network by having vertices in your network that perform routing functions. But there is so much value in the physical representation of these graphs being static um, from an efficiency point of view that I think that's the way we'll go. And I see it really as just doing in the parallel programming world what we did in the sequential programming world with self-modifying code. When I first started designing microprocessors three decades ago, it was still necessary to keep the software guys happy to allow them to write self-modifying code. Now, most microprocessors won't even support it. It turned out to be a freedom that was unnecessary and expensive. I think the same thing will be true of dynamic graph structures here. And you'll see this reflected quite strongly in the structure of our candidate machine for this space. So as Eli said, we believe um, that there is scope for an entirely new type of machine to emerge. This application is big enough, it's important enough, and the characteristics of it are different enough that it's worth building a new type of microprocessor. There will probably be many candidates that emerge. Uh, we're building one. Uh, Google have built one, two, so far. Um, many other people. Uh, are building them. <laughs> some have been public about it and some have not. Um, but the important point is probably we're not going to end up using machines that were designed for other purposes. The CPU, the, the x86 and the ARM has had a really good run. It's a machine optimized for scalar jumpy code. It does a damn good job. Um, actually probably originally designed for running Microsoft Word or Excel fast. Um, but obviously evolved since then to be the heart of most servers in data structures. The GPU is designed for manipulating low-dimensional um, matrix structures. What does a GPU do? It produces two-dimensional projections of a three-dimensional world model. That's its function. So that you can change where you are in a game and you see the new view. Um, it has characteristics that suit that 
type of low dimensional computing very well and by the same measure do not support, do not suit very well, uh, very high dimensional models which are characterized by their sparsity. Um, it's done a pretty good job of evolving into uh, linear algebra in HPC and right now it is absolutely the dominant platform for machine intelligence work but I think it's a child of necessity and better solutions will emerge and obviously that's what we're trying to do. Um, so I don't care whether ultimately it's called an IPU or a TPU or anything you like. I would have liked it to be called a GPU for a graph processing unit but unfortunately that's already gone so it'll be called something. Uh, <coughs> Here's my advice for any young person thinking of setting up a chip company. <laughs> all chip companies pretty much are microprocessor companies. Well, all digital chip companies involve processors these days. Uh, do not attempt to invent a processor architecture unless you can see clearly 20 years ahead. Um, now, that's impossible, of course. Uh, so, so as a second best thing, do, do your best not to capture today's fashion. Today's fashion is clearly deep neural networks, convolutional nets, recurrent nets, LSTMs. Uh, there are people who will build chips specifically to do that. Um, for some people, uh, they may have an economic horizon that's very short and it may be a reasonable thing to do. But for a startup trying to take over the world, it's not a reasonable thing to do. Um, Can you expand the acronyms? Uh, so, support vector machines in 2005, uh, random forests in 2010, and neural networks. Um, I remember the first time they were hot. They're hot again. <laughs> but uh, I, people ask me what was the first, what is the first uh, AI consumer product? And I point to the Microsoft Kinect box. Um, it does two things that you might classify as approximate intelligent computing. It uh, projects a uh, speckle pattern on your body and observes the distortion of the pattern and tries to work out um, a 3D point cloud of the shape of your body as you dance or play tennis. Um, and then the second thing is it then tries to correlate that 3D point cloud with uh, a model of human skeleton articulation, which is captured by actors in light suits. Um, if you were to build such a system today, surely you would use neural networks. They're the latest and greatest and probably they would do well. Uh, but there are no neural networks in the Microsoft Kinect because it came slightly too early. It's random forests, in fact, are used in, the, in that product, very successful product. Um, so if we had set out to build a chip for machine intelligence back then, we would certainly have built something for random forests and it would have been the wrong machine today. No one would have wanted to buy it. So in order to build a suitable machine today, you have to look beyond neural networks. You have to be good at all these things, at all the history we have learned, Markov random fields, various sorts of sampling model, Bayesian nets, etc. Got to be good at all those things. But you also have to be as generic as possible within the broad characteristics of the workload. Um, it's also got to be easy to program. So agnosticism to model structure, I think, is a key requirement for a machine intelligence processor to be delivered today, to be useful to researchers. <clears throat> so what are the sort of broad characteristics of machine intelligence as a workload? Uh, everyone who's thought about it. We'll have a list. Here's a sort of um, condensed version of my list. I've got a very long list. Uh, computation on graphs. That's fundamental because these models are definitely high dimensional and they're definitely sparse. So representing them as graphs is sensible. And that means you probably want a machine that's very good at scatter gather processes. Because if you embed a high dimensional model in a low dimensional memory, which is the only sort of memory we can build, then you will induce sparsity. So the model's sparse, but also you've induced more sparsity by this embedding dimension mismatch. So you want a machine that's good at scattering and gathering. Well, that's not a big fat vector machine, is it? Big fat vector machines assume there's lots of locality available, data locality available at every address location. That's not true of a general graph structure. You'll, you become as interested in your ability to generate addresses as you are in your ability to fetch data words in this sort of framework. What else can we say? Well, we can definitely say that uh, low precision arithmetic appears to be adequate. Uh, we, we're learning that more and more from uh, experimentation, but we also know that our own brain doesn't support high precision arithmetic. Uh, 
Um, and we also know that these models are, are learned from data that is very noisy. So the whole learning process is very stochastic. Uh, we also know that they're probably, in, in most cases, in fact, it may be essential that they are over-parameterized. Um, so that each parameter probably doesn't get influenced by many training samples. So it's never had enough data experience, actually, to form a high-resolution uh, value. Uh, of course, you can get high-resolution results from an ensemble effect of lots of low-resolution parameters, but the parameters themselves and the arithmetic on them fundamentally can be low-precision. At the moment, the big challenge is trying to deal with dynamic range that's larger than the precision. So today, floating point is the answer to that. Whether that will always be the answer, I don't know. But today, floating point is a nice, easy way of dealing with low-precision but higher dynamic range. Uh, our machine is going to uh, support um, a mixture of float 16s and float 32s. So pretty much everything in 16-bit floating point. So you have 11-bit precision uh, and something like a 40-bit range or an 80-bit range for product. Um, but accumulated dynamically, because some inner product accumulations can be hundreds or thousands of terms. And you get a lot of rounding noise if you only have 10 or 11 bits of mantissa precision. So the accumulation needs to be bigger than that. Whether you accumulate in 32-bit integers or single precision floats probably doesn't matter. We, we do it in single precision floats. Uh, and it's interesting, we've seen um, uh, NVIDIA evangelizing uh, using 8-bit integers uh, as a sort of, well, first of all, they start with 32-bit floats from the graphics environment, but then evangelize strongly the use of 8-bit integers, the, the deep learning ops, as Jensen used to call them. But now, of course, with Volta, they have come to uh, this sort of mixed precision float. Um, we've seen the same thing in uh, Google, the move from TPU1, which was low precision integer, quantized integers, to uh, TPU2, which is mixed precision floats as well. Um, at the moment, in, uh, Intel, the Nirvana piece of Intel, is still emphasizing uh, f integers, but it, uh, they appear to be talking about a block floating point system, actually. Um, I shall leave the other two probably unsaid. Static structure I've mentioned. Um, entropy, uh, perhaps just worth tiny mention. There are basically two ways of learning about data, or learning from data. Uh, one is a situation where you can analytically compute uh, gradients of your cost function in such a way that you know how to adjust your parameters. And uh, back propagation in deep learning machines is an example of that. Um, if, you, if you go through your forward process, in your model, compare, a, compare the result with a supervised reference result, then you can back propagate the errors and you know how to adjust your parameters. Um, but th that's kind of only half the story, because much of the story, you, you can't do that. Um, there is no uh, analytic connection between the cost function and the parameters you started with. And obviously, this is a characteristic of reinforcement learning and uh, evolution. Uh, and what do you do instead? Well, you have to sample. You have to try things out, take samples of your distribution, and estimate a gradient from those samples. So you're going to need a source of randomness in order to do that sampling process. <coughs> There's a lot of stochasticity in data. Um, so a lot of the randomness that appears to be favorable to uh, learning good models, and in particular to generalizing rather than memorizing, which is the big challenge of an over-parameterized model. Uh, a lot of the stochasticity does come from the data, but it's clear that there's also value in some stochasticity coming from the model itself, uh, or perhaps from the learning algorithm. Uh, so one thing that may be particularly important, and which we do support on our machine, um, for training with low precision weights, is the ability to do stochastic rounding when you make tiny updates to those weights. Because if you don't have stochastic rounding, then you tend to round off useful information in the same way all the time. Um, so in terms of what sort of machine we might build, here's a, a sort of desiderata, in other words, a, a list of desirable things. Um, we want to compute on graphs, so that implies that we would like a big parallel processor. I think that's kind of obvious, because all of the candidate solutions are parallel processors. In fact, all processors today are parallel processors. So we clearly want a parallel processor, and we clearly want it to be quite good at dealing with structures that are sparse. Uh, we want low precision arithmetic, mentioned that. Uh, I moot 
that if we are prepared to accept static model structure, which many of the frameworks do uh, axiomatically enforce, so in TensorFlow, for example, you start off by defining your graph structure, and then you compute on it. You don't change your graph structure. Uh, but there is certainly an alternative school of thought that thinks that you should change the structure as you go along. Um, <clears throat> I would say changing structure is okay, but probably needs to be done very slowly. Because if you change the structure, then you change the three really hard things that a compiler or someone, maybe a machine, has to do in mapping a parallel program to a parallel processor. And they are the subdivision of work into pieces, the subdivision of memory into pieces, uh, and the scheduling of messages between the pieces. And these are all, uh, at least in principle, NP-hard for a random graph. So why would you want to do them in real time on a machine? Uh, you don't really. You want to do them in the compiler. Um, and that means having a static structure by the time it reaches the machine. Um, and we would like the ability to generate lots of noise. So uh, we let's start off with how it looks, how a machine looks from a software point of view. We have our own sort of middleware graph computing uh, tool chain consists of a framework and some libraries and all the usual support tools, debuggers, etc. Visualizers, in particular, <laughs> this is uh, some of the pretty pictures are side effects of our visualizers. Um, and we call this Poplar. Uh, for historians amongst you, Poplar is where Tommy Flowers grew up. Tommy Flowers was the designer of the Colossus. The Colossus was the first programmable computer, December 1943 it ran. Um, Poplar if you like, sits in the tool chain at the same level as CUDA does in a GPU world. But because it is designed from scratch to suit a parallel machine for machine intelligence and to capture the algorithms for that world, uh, Poplar is a graph framework. So it's much more like a low-level version of TensorFlow than it is like CUDA, which is really a low-level vector language. Uh, much of the performance, of course, is captured in a set of library calls. So this is a framework, you, you write code in Python or C++, and you essentially make library calls uh, to get the, uh, the compute that you need doing. And our first hardware product uh, is uh, a PCI card, or a chassis containing that PCI card. Um, so that's, uh, that's our first target. <coughs> now, I've got to apologize. This is a pedagogical institute, and all the pedagogues, very experienced pedagogues, here present will tell you this is a dreadful foil and should never be put on a projector. <laughs> it is true, there are far too many words. But I couldn't resist the temptation to put all of the keywords on one piece of, on one foil. <laughs> um, and this really captures our compute model. So, uh, we define graphs which have two types of vertex. One is a compute vertex that is a stateful atomic function. The function itself is defined by a piece of code we call a codelet. Um, there may be many vertices that use the same codelet, uh, but it's so you've got a piece of code that defines the function, and you've got a vertex that has its own state that implements the function. The other type of vertex that we have in the model is a tensor vertex. Now, this is a pragmatism. It's an efficient way of representing big data structures. Um, so compute vertices can produce results uh, and write them to other compute vertices, or they can write them to slices of tensor vertices. Uh, and likewise, they can read from other vertices, or they can read from tensor vertices. Uh, these things are interconnected by edges, and the edges generally have no state. So they're just transports of data. Um, however, if there are loops in the graph, the edges are directed. So there can, there can be loops in the graph, and it's perfectly natural sometimes to build graphs with loops. Uh, recurrent neural networks, for example. Um, so where there are loops in the graph, we have a special type of edge that's used to break the loop, and that has the state necessary to preserve a value from one iteration of the loop to the next. So are there any particular contrasting points with the Nirvana graph model that you were showing out here? I'm not familiar enough with that model, so I don't really know. This is our model, but uh, okay. I'm not a student of Nirvana. <laughs> <coughs> now, we have uh, an idea of a compute set. A compute set is a bunch of compute vertices that can be executed in parallel because they are independent of each other. And uh, you can imagine a large graph structure can be layered into causal compute sets. And each compute set can then be presented to a parallel machine uh, 
with the freedom to execute those vertices in any order it likes, so long as it does that compute set before it does the next compute set. Uh, and then overseeing what's going on on the processor, we have a sort of control program um, <coughs> called the control program. <laughs> uh, and this schedules when compute sets get executed. And what that means is the codelet that defines the function of each vertex, each compute vertex in the compute set gets executed once. Uh, we also have uh, streams, which are simple copy mechanisms for getting data into and out of the graph, uh, usually to and from the host, because we are building accelerators that assume that there is a host that provides some sort of I.O. service. Um, they could potentially, of course, talk to other graphs. So that's it. That's our, that's our compute model. Define a graph, write a control program that says when you update vertices of the graph, and define a set of codelets that specify what the vertices do. Uh, and, the ver and the codelets uh, are atomic in the sense that they, they read all of their inputs to the vertex before, at the beginning of their run. Um, then they do their work, which may involve updating the vertices' persistent state. And then they produce their outputs. And no one will read their outputs until they've finished. And they are guaranteed to finish. In other words, they will run to completion. The term codelet has been used in some uh, other work, uh, but it is often interpreted in the other work as being stateless, in other words, as being a, a mechanism a bit like functional program. Uh, but these codelets are stateful. Um, now, if you capture uh, a program for uh, machine learning today in TensorFlow, which is a, an API that we support on our machine, uh, you define a graph. TensorFlow will then make the graph bigger because it will add uh, vertices for the uh, back propagation, uh, assuming it's training you're doing. Um, it'll add some vertices for doing uh, weight updates. It may add some vertices for distributing um, uh, reductions across multiple processes, for example. Um, so you might capture a graph of 1,000 vertices, and TensorFlow might turn that into a graph of 5,000 vertices. Um, that then passes to the popular compiler that blows the whole thing into many, many, many more pieces. So we typically deal with uh, graph structures in our, at the popular level, uh, which have millions of vertices. And this is important because you'll see that our machine has parallelism of order tens of thousands. So we need a lot of parallelism in the problem. And this is one of the unique characteristics of machine intelligence, I think, um, in that there is a lot of exposed parallelism in these graphs that we can exploit with a machine. This one's ResNet 50, as you will have noted. <coughs> so if we build a machine, what might limit its performance? Well, maybe compute. <laughs> Maybe the rate at which we can access data, maybe the rate at which we can generate addresses to access sparse data, perhaps the rate at which we can generate entropy. None of the above power. There are really today in silicon only two first class resources. One is power and the other is memory that is local. Um, how do you define local? Uh, not usually in millimeters. You define local in terms of energy the energy required to get the data to where you need to process it. So if you like, the second bullet is the same as the first bullet, almost. Not, not quite, because if you could build really, really dense memory, then you could get more of it local in that power sense. Um, silicon, as you probably know here, it is Berkeley ECS after all, has been power limited since about 2005, since about 90 nanometer generation. Um, for very good reasons associated with subthreshold slope of silicon and the use of electrons as charge carriers, which we won't go into, but it is definitely power limited. Um, <clears throat> and I think the key uh, challenge of designing processes today, whether they're parallel processes or simple ones, um, is the management of these two key resources and to some extent the ability to trade between them, which you can do. What we're not limited by now is how many logic transistors can you put on a die? I remember those times <laughs> where we used to lay out everything by hand to cram them in. But they are long, long gone. We can put, so that, that box on the left is a little bit smaller than the reticle that is used in the optics of every fab in the world, every big fab in the world. 
So, so you can't build a chip bigger than that, more or less. The, the reticle itself, I think, is 850 or something like that. You need some street structures around it. So about 825 is the biggest chip you can build. Now, actually, if I just fill that with floating point units, I can put a petaflop, a floating point, on that chip, a petaflop, on one chip. The problem is the thing in red. <laughs> it would require a kilowatt, and I haven't allowed any uh, spare energy to move data to and from it. So it's a useless petaflop. <laughs> but the point here is we're not limited by transistors to do logic. That's not a problem. Um, <clears throat> and you can see the way it's going. This is a, a bunch of um, x86s. I've chosen the biggest couple of x86s in each of the last five generations. You can see the, from the, the top lines, which are how the logic density and the SRAM cell density are moving, uh, the top lines show that uh, Morse law is still alive and well. We can still geometrically scale these things and we can cram more stuff in. And we get, we're still getting about 2x per process node. The nodes have slowed down. They're about two and a half years each for, over this time frame and they probably get a bit longer going forwards. But um, we can still geometrically scale, at least for the next uh, 10 or 20 years. But what we can't scale is the energy per operation. I've shown it the other way up because then the curves move in the same direction. <laughs> um, and uh, Intel have done what uh, almost everyone else is doing uh, in response to this. They have chosen to sort of route to the energy per operation uh, and also route to increase the number of cores so in order to try and get a net effect of uh, a 2x per node. Um, but the only reason that they're doing that is because of this power limit. Um, so what happens uh, in this situation is that pretty much every big chip is underused. Um, the GPUs are a great example. GPUs are, uh, are built for three completely different markets. Um, and if you use a GPU in one of those markets, you're actually only using a part of its resources. So if you use your NVIDIA Volta today for machine learning, if you can get one, <laughs> or a Pascal, um, then obviously you're not using things like its rendering engines. You're not using its 64-bit floating point. Um, so there's hardware there which is not for that particular application. Um, I've shown sort of some typical examples. These actually include some ability to get data to and from the floating point units. Um, so in terms of uh, aerial density, they're slightly lower than the earlier um, foil. Um, but however big your arithmetic, you, you end up with the same sort of limit, about 50 watts per gigahertz per square centimetre um, of compute density. We can't really extract, using air and metal, more than about 200 watts from a computer die today. I dare say our ability to do that will get better and we will learn how to deal with bigger powers. But today about 200 watts. Um, and that means that today at about one and a half gigs, which is roughly where the state of the art GPUs run, uh, we can really only power about a third of the silicon. Um. <coughs> now the other equation, the other part of the story, of course, is memory. Uh, the state of the art today for external memory, in other words, memory not on the same die as the logic, is to use a silicon interposer and surround your logic die by a vertically stacked DRAM in uh, in the form of HBM2. Very sexy technology, absolutely heroic achievement, <laughs> to be frank. Um, it has managed to get the energy per byte uh, down, well, roughly one picajoule per bit, so about eight picajoules per byte to get a DRAM value onto your logic die or to write one out to your DRAM. Um, and uh, enormous number of pins, about 6,500 pins, are available on the silicon interposer, which allows us to get close to a terabyte. No, it hasn't quite got there yet, it's at 900 gigabytes uh, per second. And if you use that 900 gigabytes per second, that's going to burn about 60 watts of your 200 watt budget. And that's roughly what happens in today's really big GPUs. They burn about 60 watts in the memory system, 140 watts or thereabouts left for the uh, CPU, maybe a bit more. Um, the IPU does the thing on the right, which is it distributes its memory and its logic all over the die in small pieces. Um, in other words, it achieves the completely local memory story. Now, how do we define locality? Well, uh, in our case, in this way, at about a sensible 
operating speed, say one and a half gigs, around about the operating speed of a GPU, uh, you can reasonably achieve single cycle access to about 16 kilobyte tile of memory. Now, if you allow another cycle to get to a kilobyte in an array, sorry, a 16 kilobyte tile in an array of tiles, so one cycle to get to your target tile, one cycle to access it, and another cycle to come back with that value, that might reasonably fit into a nice little simple pipeline. Three ticks. And then there'll be some more ticks for computing addresses and such like. Now, what's the radius of that assembly? It's about 256 kilobytes. So that's roughly the partitioning size of memory that makes sense today at about that speed with roughly 16 nanometer technology. Now, with that size of local memory, you, the, the piece of logic that's next to that local memory can access um, bytes with about one picojoule per byte. <coughs> but also, if you cover a silicon die with these things, um, the net bandwidth that you can get is, is enormous, about 60 terabytes per second, for the same power budget as the HBM2. So you can see that distributed memory on a chip, as well as having latency advantages, that's not the big deal here. The big deal is the energy advantage and the bandwidth advantage. We get about uh, 70 times, or 65 times, the, um, the bandwidth to that memory. But we get much less memory, of course. Yeah. So what about the capacity? You, you also get whatever that is. Of uh, well, I can tell you. So we're building a roughly, I'll show you shortly, roughly reticle-sized chip. And uh, we can fit about 300 megabytes of RAM on there by using much of the area of the die. Correct. So Correct. So yes. So this is a big problem. Okay. <laughs> uh, and obviously, you know, this is part of the new world. If, if this platform is attractive, then how do we deal with the fact that we've got much less memory? We've got much greater bandwidth to it, and we can access, you know, that bandwidth is, is within the same power budget, so much more efficient power-wise. Um, but we've got much less of it. So how do we live with that? Well, I'll come to that. So I'm just uh, these are kind of cartoons, right? This is, this yes. is not what I'd actually see. <laughs> uh, well, so um, let me show you the next foil. <laughs> so the, here's two stories. Um, <clears throat> the GPU plan is on the left. And that is, uh, I put mostly logic on my die. A little bit of memory, but I fill most of the die with logic. I can't use all of that logic at the same time. So what do I do? I put down logic for three different markets. In the GPU's case, it's now machine learning graphics, and HPC. They all require different types of arithmetic for a start. HPC want double precision. Graphics want single precision. Uh, machine learning wants half precision. So they don't use the same hardware. Um, I get to build one chip. I sell it to three different markets. Each market uses just a third of the logic. So the fact that the logic, that third of the logic, burns all of the power budget doesn't matter. This is a sensible economic model. But there is an alternative model, and that's the one that we adopt, which is rather than have lots of dark silicon when you're operating, actually devote most of your die to RAM, because RAM has a much lower power density than logic. So fill all that dark silicon with, with memory. Distribute it, of course, because if you don't distribute, then you won't get the, the energy efficiency of the locality. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I have blue and <laughs> uh, flip RAM from FPU, so yeah, this makes sense. <laughs> okay. And that ratio there, roughly 25% logic, 75% memory, I think is probably about right. That'll give you around about a 50-50 split of energy with today's technology. Uh, so our chip, our IPU chip, is mostly RAM. It's mostly a memory chip. Uh, so I, this is my moot. Silicon efficiency used to be about how many transistors could you get in each square millimeter. Um, then it was about how fast can I go. Remember the gigahertz wars? Of course you do. David does. <laughs> Um, but it's not about that anymore. An efficient chip now is one that can use all of the power all of the time. So you're being inefficient if you fail to use your compute budget. Uh, and there are three sort of simple ways in which we can try and achieve this. One is try and keep memory local, as I've discussed. And I'm just going to quickly cover a couple of the others as well. One is to serialize communication with compute. Surprising, but actually turns out to be in support of this goal. Uh, and the other is recompute things. Don't remember so much stuff. You haven't got as much memory. 
And if you use memory, actually, the cost of storing values out to a DRAM is, can often be hundreds or thousands of floating point calculations worth of energy. So it's often more efficient to recalculate those values than it is to remember them. So serializing communication and compute. First example. The top line is what we used to do. <coughs> You'd assume that you had to overlap communication and compute. You would budget design your machine with resources that made some guess as to what the ratio of energy for those two tasks should be. And then you would actually run your application and the ratio would be slightly different. Um, that's OK. You just save some power. Your program would still take as long to run. Now, in the new world, that's inefficient. I don't want to save power. I want to get the answer faster. How do I get the answer faster? You serialize communication and compute. You flip them around. You do all your compute in pieces, and then you do all your communication in pieces. You keep alternating between those two. <laughs> Obviously, it's not trivial. <laughs> I have to balance my machine such that each of the little computers on it in my distributed world uh, take roughly the same amount of time to do their compute. And when they're doing information exchange communication, the same is true. Um, so you can only do this if you've got a um, parallel processing problem, which is easy to balance. But we have got a problem that exposes a parallel, a, an order of parallelism far greater than we've ever seen before. And that gives us this opportunity. <coughs> So the IPU that we are building operates in exactly that manner. It is a hard implementation of what's called bulk synchronous parallel. In other words, when the machine is executing, it constantly alternates between a phase of compute in which all of the local processor nodes are just computing on values that they hold locally. And then when they've all finished, there's a synchronization event. And then they all go into an exchange phase in which values are just transferred between the nodes, but no compute goes on. As they finish sending and receiving those values, then they flip back into the compute phase, and they go round and round that loop many times. This is an old idea. It was proposed by Leslie Valiant and uh, Bill McCall in 1991, I think. It uh, has been used um, you know, in data center context between server machines, but I don't think anyone's built a sort of hard parallel processing on chip using this mechanism before. So here's what our machine looks like. Um, we, uh, because we have a RAM-dominated technology, actually the power density of our device is a bit lower than a typical big GPU chip, uh, even though it's a very big die. These are near reticle sized dies. Uh, and it means that in the power budget for a PCI card, where you would previously have had a GPU and some DRAMs, instead you have two of these IPU things bolted together by a whole load of high-speed connections. Um, each of them has 1,216 processors on. Um, so between the two, 2,400 processors. There are actually a few more than that for redundancy reasons. Um, they each have a big all-to-all -all interconnect uh, mesh in the middle, which we call the exchange. Um, and each of those exchanges uh, has a bisectional bandwidth of about 8 terabytes per second. Um, the sort of bandwidth you simply can't get off a chip, but you can get between processors on a chip. Um, and because our first product is uh, PCI-centric, we have a pair of uh, PCI ports. <coughs> um, we, uh, we haven't yet decided exactly what the peak performance will be, but it will certainly be above 200 teraflops. Uh, and in total on this card, we have about 600 megabytes of on-chip SRAM. There is no attached memory, so there's no external DRAM. So we're definitely comparing a sort of GPU card that's the same size and the same power, would have you know, perhaps a similar amount of arithmetic, um, but would have its memory uh, much more energy hungry, uh, but much bigger, about 16 gigabytes, perhaps. With, uh, with this one, where instead of that 16 gigabytes, we go down to 600 megabytes, but we can access it at 65 times the bandwidth. Can that machine be useful? <laughs> uh, this shows how the bulk synchronous parallel protocol is used to communicate between chips and also between the chips and the host. 
Now, between chips, you can't maintain time determinism because high-speed connections can lose packets and you may have to retransmit them, for example. Um, so it becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, I probably won't go into this in the interest of time. Um, but it is possible to expand the BSP world across a cluster of chips. Uh, and our technology actually supports clustering of these IPUs. So we can build clusters that have gigabytes of memory. What is the um, BSP acronym? Bulk Synchronous Parallel. Um, now, on chip, our exchange mechanism is entirely time deterministic. In other words, after the synchronization event that occurs between those two BSP phases, all communication on chip happens at exact times known to the compiler. So the compiler can do a perfect job of scheduling communication between these processors. Um, and this is one reason why the static nature of the graph is important. It can be exploited to map to a time deterministic interconnect. And it's entirely feasible to build a 60 odd terabit per second interconnect on a chip, have it consume a relatively small fraction of power and have it entirely time deterministic at this sort of scale. Um, the exchange of information actually on the chip is, is coordinated by program. So the little processors that we make our big chip out of, they effectively have two instruction sets. They have one instruction set that they use in the compute phase that does floating point and all that sort of stuff. And they have a different instruction set that they use in the exchange phase which has instructions that do sending and receiving. And those two instruction sets can be optimized separately. And this is another potential advantage of serializing compute with communication. You can optimize those two tasks differently. Uh, this is a, a trace of roughly where the time goes. This is just a small fragment. I'll show you some other interesting traces. Um, the dark blue bit is when we're computing, and the yellow bit is when we're exchanging information. And the vertical axis is, is all the tiles. So there are 1,216 tiles on one chip there, or 2,432 on two chips, in that vertical axis. Um, we, just, we order them by count to make it easier to look at it. Um, the light blue stuff is where tiles are waiting around. They're waiting for a synchronization event. Now, sometimes it turns out that, say, the compiler finds it easy to map 1,024 tiles, or to map the program to 1,024 tiles, but hard to map it to 1,200 tiles. In that case, it can map. You can use just the 1,024 tiles. The, process, the processor will realize that it can increase the clock rate because less of its logic is being used. So in other words, the processor, to some, to some extent, will adapt to an underutilization of tiles. Uh, <coughs> let me show you some real examples. So here's ResNet 50 in inference. Uh, you can see this is a batch size of eight, and uh, you can see that we spend much of our time uh, computing. It's interesting when you see it written like this; it, it looks like all the time you spend not computing is wasted time. <laughs> but if you think of it as energy, then if you were doing these two in an overlapped manner, then the compute would just have to operate more slowly. So actually, it's not wasted at all. Serialization does not waste anything. Uh, you can see some places where things are wasted, such as down here. These are optimizations where you drop down to just a few tiles and everyone else is waiting. The different rows are as time going down? No, this, this is one long stream which we've simply folded. Just folded? Yeah. Okay, so, so this is one iteration of uh, ResNet 50 inference. Well, where, where would uh, communication to the host be? Uh, well, in this case, there is no communication to the host because you're just doing inference. So, you, you, so uh, we recur off. Off the ends of these two, yeah. Okay. Um, let me show you some other examples. There is uh, ResNet 50's training, a batch size of four. A uh, bit more choppy, you can see some more opportunities for optimizing. Here's DeepBench LSTM. This one's really neat, actually, because it's almost completely efficient. <coughs> Very little time lost to waiting or synchronization. And uh, here's uh, a deep voice wavenet on 64 tiles. Yes. How big are the models that people are using at the moment? 
25 megabytes to 240 megabytes. No. Yeah. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a trick question. You, you will know the answer. However, to most people, the answer is the thing I try to run on my 16 gigabyte GPU card doesn't fit. Therefore, the model or the problem is bigger than 16 gigabytes. But that is not true. Uh, GPUs have to replicate data uh, expensively in order to try and make them efficient. Um, they also don't exercise this idea of trading recomputation for storage. Um, fundamentally, what should dominate the size of the models should be the number of parameters. It shouldn't be the activations. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to come to that very shortly. Have I got another? On Berkeley time, how much more yeah, minutes have I got? Try to finish within the next five minutes. Five minutes. Ask you a quick follow-up on your question. So with the Can I delay you until the end? Yeah, yeah just wait. Otherwise, I'll minutes. never get through my five minutes. <laughs> uh, this is our core arithmetic, roughly speaking. Um, this happens on every tile. Uh, it has some similarities with NVIDIA's tensor cores. It has some similarities with the uh, TPUs. It is a little bit different to either of them. I suspect everyone's going to evolve to the same sort of arithmetic in terms of precisions and in terms of basic functions over time. Um, so this is differentiating at the moment, I think. But I think fundamentally, a distributed architecture is the four by four. Is, does that mean four, 16 32-bit uh, floating points? Is that what 4 by 4 with F32 means? That's correct. That's right. Correct. Okay. Uh, so the machine will actually do, well, each tile on the machine, each, we, uh, we call a tile a little elemental processor with its little piece of memory, 1,216 of those on each chip, 2,400 on each card. Uh, each one will do 16 flops per cycle at float 32, uh, or 64 flops per cycle at float 16 with float 32 accumulation. So float 16 multiplies, float 32 adds. I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. Uh, entropy, we have hard support for generating entropy in various ways. We can, we can randomly drop the elements of vectors uh, with uh, uh, a probability described by a parameter of the instruction. Uh, we can generate Gaussian shape samples. We can generate uh, uniform samples. Um, and uh, crucially, we can do stochastic rounding. So whenever we do an inner product, for example, or whenever we do weight updates, we can actually do the rounding stochastically at full speed. Um, I don't think there's a machine on the market today that can do that. Most machines find the generation of noise very expensive today. Uh, <coughs> so the final thing I wanted to discuss was this business of trading recomputation for remembering. Um, because if it costs you 100 times the energy of a floating point operation to remember a value or to recall it, then surely there is some trading to be done. Um, this has been observed by many people, so I'm not saying anything new. Uh, typically in a neural network, when we sweep forward through the network, we save all of the activations we compute, every one of them. Um, and in a GPU, they're all saved out to DRAM. And then when you sweep backwards to do the uh, backpropagation and weight updates, then you retrieve them all. Well, you don't have to do that. You could save, say, one in four, and then actually recalculate the missing ones when you go backwards. And uh, if you do that, then you get these sorts of plots. Um, so this is actually running from TensorFlow. Uh, the TensorFlow one, is, there's one described as less greedy below that, because TensorFlow isn't actually ideal. So we've, we've tuned the TensorFlow graph to show what could be done with remembering everything. <laughs> And then the red graph is what happens if you just recompute some values. In this case, this is uh, ResNet 50 training. And we've just kept one set of activations for each of the uh, residue modules in a ResNet. Um, and we've recomputed all the other values. You end up doing a bit more compute, about 30% more compute. And your memory goes down by a factor of three. And this is uh, this memory, by the way. The very small offset at the beginning, at uh, the left there, is the weight memory. So you can see how memory consumption is dominated by activations. The weight memory is intercept on the y-axis. Well, where, the, where the curves intercept the y-axis. I'm going to go out of camera view. <laughs>
there. <laughs> so the weights aren't a big, and this is quite a, quite a big neural network, and the weights aren't that big a deal. Oh, there are bigger ones, obviously. Um, here's another one. This is a, a bigger one. This is a dense net, 200 layer dense net. Uh, you can see in this case we trade five times the memory consumption for about 25% more compute. That's a very, very good deal from an energy point of view. Uh, you can even sometimes exercise this trade-off on the forward path in inference. So this is WaveNet. There are two different ways of computing. In fact, there are lots of intermediate ways as well of computing WaveNet um, that trade off the amount of compute you do each step for the amount of me remembering that you have to do. And uh, some of you who like to keep up to date <laughs> may know that there are now things called reversible nets which don't need to keep the activations at all because they actually arrange for the convolutional modules to be reversible. In other words, not only can you compute the next layer's activations from this layer, but also you can do the opposite. You can compute this layer's activations from the next layer. So when you go backwards, you can just compute them as you go. It's a very neat idea, really neat idea. Um, there are some layers where you can't do this, layers where you lose information because you're pooling or striding. Uh, so this shows uh, that uh, even with something that's reversible, I can actually improve it by recomputing some values, the lost values. It also shows that the current state of the art of reversible computing is about the same as non-reversible computing that uses recomputation. So maybe these things will all come together at the same point. But the point is, today's memory consumption by GPUs is not what you need to consume. It's just what that platform happens to do. So I've got some benchmarks just to finish, because everyone wants to know whether this actually works. <laughs> and so I'm going to show you a few benchmarks. This is the first time these have been shown in public. Um, we have actually got a blog going out around about now, so they will be on the web as well. Uh, this is ResNet 50 training, a nice commonly known thing. Variety of different batch sizes. Now, of course, we have small memory, so we tend to emphasize small batches. Nice thing about small batches, apart from the fact that they don't require much memory, is that you can parallelize up many more machines without damaging the effectiveness of SGD as a learning algorithm. Um, so we can, for example, with a batch size of 64, we can deploy eight of our C2 cards. In other words, 16 of our chips with a batch size of 64. This is the sort of batch size that would fill one GPU. So if you can afford it, not only do you get faster performance on a single uh, accelerator, I'll show you how much faster in a minute, but you can also use many more accelerators on the same job. So if you're Google, if you've got google size budget, then uh, if you're a humble academic, that's probably less attractive. <laughs> uh, this is how we compare like for like with Volters. Obviously, we haven't got Volters yet, but uh, we have got Pascals, and NVIDIA have told us for this benchmark how much faster Volta is, so it's a simple scaling operation. Um, a set of eight IPU cards, in other words, 16 chips on eight cards, uh, will keep up with 54 Volters. 54 Volters. Same performance, 16,000 images per second for ResNet 50 training. So this idea does work. And of course, that fits, obviously, because I'm showing you the benchmark. <laughs> so the memory size is not a problem. <coughs> OK, an LSTM, everyone's next question. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is one of the ones in the uh, Baidu DeepBench set. I've chosen this size because it's actually used by Baidu's uh, uh, deployed deep voice system. Uh, not deep voice, deep speech system. Um, so it's uh, 1,536 hidden units, uh, 50 time steps. And this is the multiple on, in this case, uh, Pascal performance that the IPU achieves. The multiple. So this, we are 200 times faster than a Pascal on this benchmark. This is entirely because for LSTMs, GPUs are totally limited by their memory bandwidth. And we've just upped our memory bandwidth by a couple of orders of magnitude. So. This, actually, this result shouldn't surprise, but it's, <laughs> it does. It's a remarkable result. Um, will Volta be any bigger than that? Well, only by the ratio of memory bandwidth, which is maybe 30% faster than Pascal. So, so no, 
Um, and interestingly, of course, these are latency constrained applications. Uh, if you take the latency down to a, to a couple of milliseconds, then uh, the GPU, the Pascal GPU, simply can't perform the calculation in time. So the, uh, the performance advantage there, if you like, is infinite. And then finally, um, a WaveNet, because a WaveNet's quite an interesting structure. Again, it has a hard latency constraint. If you can't keep up with, this is, um, this is uh, Baidu's uh, deep voice. The WaveNet that, that is the heart of Baidu's deep voice system. It's the first version of deep voice, deep voice one, not deep voice two. They haven't said to enough about deep voice two for us to be able to copy. But with deep voice one, they have. Um, if you can't uh, generate samples at 16 kilohertz, then you can't do the job. Um, and uh, when wave nets were first proposed, there was much commenting that actually this was an application where CPUs were faster than GPUs in a machine learning uh, algorithm. Uh, the CPUs are quite big. They're uh, big Haswells with many cores. Um, but nevertheless, they, they can do this benchmark. And the GPUs, in this case, it's uh, Maxwell, I think. Yes, Maxwell Titan X simply isn't fast enough to do the job. Um, the IPU can do the job, uh, both for uh, fair voice quality, but also for the, the very good voice quality benchmark um, that uh, Baidu specified. And uh, so the GPUs are out of the running. It's, a, it's an IPU versus CPU race. And the nice thing is the IPU does that with only a fraction of the cores on one die. In other words, you can do many, many streams of that wave net on one IPU die. And if you do, then you can get a throughput for the same power in the same form factor <coughs> on the IPU of 183 times this heavy, you know, this is a $2,000 CPU. <laughs> so it's a heavy CPU, 183 times. So we've uh, pr previously our marketing function, which, which is my co-founder in the business, um, has talked about the IPU having a 100x advantage for some things and 10x for others. Uh, you can see these numbers are not made up. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, very exciting. And um, I wonder if we can get a reaction. Uh, you said that this is uh, the bigger than anything you've experienced. Well, you've experienced the computer revolution. You've experienced the mm. internet. Uh, and uh, so you've experienced many things. So I was rather shocked to hear that this was the beginning of a wave that is bigger than what we've already experienced. I think the impact of building machines, which quite soon will be smarter than people, is the biggest transition humans will ever go through. It's, it's, to me, it's a no-brainer. I, I wish I was 30 years younger. I'd like to experience <laughs> it. <laughs> it's bigger than the harnessing of artificial power. Uh, it's certainly bigger, you know, 70 years of dumb computing have utterly transformed the way that humans live. Uh, intelligent computing is much bigger than the dumb computing. So it's bigger than all the stuff that we've had so far, including, you know, mobile telephony. I almost regard that as a branch of dumb computing. <laughs> uh, we missed a question from this guy. So I'm involved with the a critical problem with this model. So mm. you showed the batch size training of four for ResNet yeah. on a single device. So the results that show unless you do a batch size of 32, you won't be able to recover the accuracy. So I was wondering if you ever performed even that batch size of 64 is distributed. So every one of the IPUs is seeing a batch size of eight or four. So I was wondering if, you know, it would be great to show some accuracy results. Because with this, you lose a considerable accuracy. Well, no. So what we do is, even though each IPU only sees a batch of four, we run the batch of 64, because we're trying to get like for like with the GPUs through the system, four at a time. Then we do all of the aggregating of gradients, and then we do the weight update. Well, the results won't be the same unless you do it on a device, because many of the layers, like, for example, the batch norm, you have to have you know, when you do it optimally, you have to see 32. If you don't see a 32 and you do the batch norm, you won't get yeah. the correct, so or you won't get an optimal output. <laughs> and so experiments that we've performed show that you get a, you, you will incur a considerable loss in accuracy. We have been very careful to make sure that even the batch norm uh, experiences batch of 64. In other words, this is exactly the same numerically. It's just that you run the uh, values through, uh, across multiple devices, uh, fewer you know, on each device. Uh, 
Yeah, assuming you're referring to that batch of 64 there. Okay, I wonder if we have... You will uh, get the same result. Yeah, I wonder if we have uh, other questions from the students. Uh, I, I had a question. I mean, the, the lesson we're learning is to, to integrate uh, memory with logic. Uh, so the hardware people kind of, they realize this is, this is coming. And, uh, but it's going to help all the other competing styles of computing as well. Uh, you've obviously gone as far as you can with today's technology in that direction. Mm. Um, uh, but uh, once two are integrated, are you still going to have that big advantage? Uh, relative to what? Relative to all the things that came before where they, they also could benefit greatly from integrating. Uh, uh, well, it's certainly true problems. that if NVIDIA, for example, start to move the memory uh, from off-chip to on-chip, um, then obviously, asymptotically, they'll end up at the same point. Yeah. <laughs> um, I suppose a different question is, how scalable are the two solutions? So suppose uh, in the next few years, we get to a position where the compute hardware on our chip is 10 times more powerful. Um, in the NVIDIA case, to keep up the memory bandwidth to the external DRAM would have to go up by a factor of 10. Uh, now, there is, as far as I can see, no prospect of that happening as quickly as the amount of compute can go up. However, a distributed machine, it happens automatically. Uh, in other words, the distributed machine can follow at full speed what's left of Moore's law, um, whereas the two-chip solution can't. Not, not unless we invent some way of connecting chips together. Uh, the other thing I noticed is you had all-to-all -all connectivity. Yeah. And I've given that a little bit of thought, and that's about the limit. I mean, 1,200 to 1,200 mm. is sort of very close to the limit. Is that going to be a problem for uh, uh, the next generation, the generation after that? Uh, not for at least the next three or four generations. I've done the sums. Um, you can see the amount of space required in the center to connect all these guys together. So that center black rectangle is just wires all over the place? Just uh, there, is a, there are lots of transistors there, but it's, it's, stateless, it's a stateless transport, so effectively it's yeah. wires, pipeline wires. Yeah. Um, so yes, in fact, the, the process is arranged in columns um, for, for very good reasons. Um, and so, uh, for example, a processor might send a message up to the spine along and then up to a processor up there. Yeah. So it's a, it's a fishbone layout. Yeah. Uh, the main reason for making it a fishbone rather than the grid is because it's much easier to relocate code. So there are many cases where uh, memory would be consumed by multiple copies of code. Uh, and you don't want that to happen because your memory is very precious. Um, so what you really want is for that any copying of code to be transient. So you have a master copy of code, and before you run a layer that requires the same code to be distributed over many tiles, you broadcast the code, and then they all use the code. Now, you can only do that in a time-deterministic interconnect if you can drop the code at multiple places on the die and have the same timing behavior. Now, it's much easier to achieve on a fishbone than it is on a grid. One, one last question. Could you say just a bit about the, the scaling this out story? How do, how do you put 64 of these together? What, what are your thoughts there? Uh, I think I won't today. Uh, we've, we've sort of decided how much we're going to say at this stage. Okay. Uh, we haven't launched our product yet. Um, we have said that we are, well, so, so our sort of closest uh, partners uh, will receive this product in the first quarter of next year. Um, <laughs> so, uh, just a question about, uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about what you need to do outside of the math libraries themselves? What kinds of changes do you need to do in terms of data layouts and other things inside the framework in order to most efficiently use this engine? Uh, <laughs> that, that is a very, very complicated subject. <laughs> um, you know, what, what is your approach to solving this triplet of NP hard problems? <laughs> Suffice it to say, probably as much work has gone into the graph compiler technology that we use uh, as has gone into the chip design. Yeah, I guess my question is, is about, you know, when it comes to actually deploying, deploying the solution, uh, do you have to go in and do a lot of work within the framework itself and basically release, you know, a separate branch of each of the major frameworks that's that where the data structures and the, and the, you know, the data layouts are tuned for your chip? 
or can you use basically the same one with the same kinds of data layouts that, because I know Intel, for example, did a lot of work, yeah. right, to change data layouts and TensorFlow and other things to, to so get it to work better on it. To some extent, it depends on the framework. TensorFlow, actually, with the XLA system, uh, it now, now is very good at mapping to a rich variety of machine backends. It does a, a, a reasonable job of mapping to GPUs and FPGAs, and they, they you know, couldn't be more different. Um, so TensorFlow does a good job of that. Uh, but the other thing to say is that much of the heavy lifting when it comes to preparing tools for these sorts of machines actually doesn't occur in the framework. It occurs in the libraries. Um, and the libraries are basically the same whichever framework you're yeah. using, um, so long as the um, API you know, is consistent with the language. And but all of the frameworks that have emerged so far have centered on C++ or Python. So as long as you remain um, friendly to that world and you optimize the libraries to the machine. So our libraries will be totally different to you know, QDNN, for example. But they, but they will be the same libraries whether you're using PyTorch or TensorFlow. And that's where much of the work goes. OK, so with that, let's uh, thank Simon Knowles again. Thank you. Sorry?